course, the Hanshin Lecture Series and the Philosophy Forum. It's my privilege this afternoon to introduce Chedidaya Purdy. He is the Robert Everett Professor of Law at the uh, Duke University Law School. And uh, although he works in a law school, his writing, the distance between his writings and what really matters is much shorter than that of a typical law school, uh, a law journal article. <laughs> but give my convoluted parlance, I didn't want to offend any law professors. <laughs> and uh, you'll uh, see this this evening when at 8 o'clock in the Dennis Theater, Professor Purdy will talk about environmental ethics for the Anthropocene. And you will see it right now when uh, Professor Purdy talks about ecology and political economy in the history of capitalism. Please join me in welcoming <clears throat> Professor Purdy. Professor Borgman, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for coming on a really beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, when they told me I'd be giving a seminar, I imagined something much more along the lines of a small table with a dozen or so of us around it. So I'm going to try to talk in that spirit. Um, tonight's lecture will be a more formal one. Uh, and I hope that I'll be able to leave plenty of time um, both to clear up the questions that I'm sure I'll have left hanging, but also for us to press on with some of the themes that I, I want to raise. <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking in part about what's called the Anthropocene or the Anthropocene. There are at least three different ways of, of pronouncing it. Um, and I'm indifferent um, among them. Um, but its meaning I'm not indifferent to at all. It's, it's quite a serious idea um, that geologists, and others, um, including lots of people in humanities departments, have begun putting forward in the last decade or so. Um, when people say Anthropocene, they're offering a new word for what they say is a new geological era um, along the lines of Holocene or Pleistocene or the famous ones you, you will have heard of. Um, and the word means roughly something like the epic of humanity. So the idea that it represents is that we've entered a period when people are a force and maybe the defining force in the development of the planet. If this is true, it promises to change everything in ways that we've only begun to think through. Um, a part of what I'm going to talk about is how the idea of the Anthropocene helps us to think about the themes of political economy, the relationship between political life and economic organization, and specifically how it helps us to think about the history of capitalism and the history of landscapes, the places and terrains where we live, and how all of these themes I've just named are interconnected. So the first thing that I'd want to do is break down the idea that we live in a new era called the Anthropocene into two distinct observations, two things we could mean when we say that this is the Anthropocene. The first I would call the Anthropocene condition. Um, and what I mean by that is the accumulation of a, a set of raw facts about the, the extent and intensity of the human footprint on the world. The way that there's nothing we haven't touched or changed from the upper atmosphere to fairly deep in the sea from the chemistry of the globe to the species that we've allowed to live in wilderness areas that we've set aside. Everything has our mark on it. 
And to a considerable degree, the world that we're going to live in going forward is going to be the world that we've made. Call that the Anthropocene condition. The second um, thing I would break the Anthropocene idea down into is what I would call the Anthropocene insight. Um, what, I, what I mean by this is that when we talk about nature, we're of course very seldom just talking about facts. We also tend to be talking about what's beautiful or what's ugly, what's worth preserving, and what we're willing to give up. What's there to admire and what's there to use? And at a deeper level, when people have talked about nature over the course of time, they've often been using their ideas about nature to have arguments about burning questions in their social and political lives. Was democracy natural or was monarchy natural? This was a very intense argument in much of early modern thought. Was human slavery natural or a violation of natural law? This was a very intensely fought idea, um, again, for, for well over a century. So when we've talked about nature, whether we're talking about landscapes and species or whether we're talking about a broader idea of what the organizing principle and meaning of the whole living world is. We're not just having an objective conversation. We're also having a cultural and political and moral argument about what's important and what makes it important and how we fit into that and how we, what we can learn from it and how we can try to get right with it. Um, what I call the Anthropocene insight is, re is the recognition that when we talk about nature, this is, this is part of what's going on. Um, so the world that we live in is the world that we've made in two senses. One is literal landscape formation, atmospheric chemistry, which species survive and which species go extinct. And another is more cultural or, or metaphoric. The, the world that we live in is partly made up of the meanings that we've made the ways that we've learned to interpret nature and value it and talk about it. <clears throat> These are both ways in which, when we relate to the larger living world today, we live in uh, an age of humanity. So I'd put those, <clears throat> those two parts of the Anthropocene together, the Anthropocene condition and the Anthropocene insight. I think, too, that we can think about the dawning of the Anthropocene by seeing it as a stage in a great historical process of what you might call denaturalization. Uh, between roughly the 16th century and the 18th or 19th century, it became harder and harder to deny that political order was not something natural, but was something made. <clears throat> For a very long time, it had been argued. Is it na I alluded to this before. Is it natural to have kings? Does the fact that there are eagles in the sky and lions on the savanna indicate that everything is organized in a hierarchical way and that the kings of a society are just another example of that same natural principle. This was the kind of argument that theologians and philosophers and um, popularizers of political argument would, would make it at one time in a serious way. But in the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes argued very powerfully in a book called Leviathan that many of you will have come across that helped to launch a larger and longer history of political theory um, 
that described political order as something deliberately created by human decisions and human agreement rather than something that we're simply born into and inherit and have to live by. And by the time the American Constitution was made, the people who wrote it thought of themselves as drafters and framers. And if you think about those very conventional terms, which we use all the time when we talk about where the Constitution came from, they're architectural images. They're images of making something according to a design. So they were living through a recognition that political order isn't something natural, not simply natural anyway. It's something made by artificial <clears throat> human decisions and human construction. The second great episode of denaturalization was, I would say, the recognition through the course of the 19th century that economic order is also made rather than natural that the relationships of ownership and labor, dependence and control that people have in our lives of material interdependence of production and reproduction and exchange, that these are created and we made them in the form that we find them in and they could be made in other forms, maybe very different forms. For a long time it had been thought that economic life, like political life, was a natural fact. That the household was the natural form of social life and the big social world was just like one big household with some um, men who owned land and gave orders in charge and others doing the labor and the women helping with the babies and so on and that, um, that fell away. Another great episode of denaturalization. So the, the Anthropocene I think stands in part for a third great chapter in the story that I've been sketching, where we realize that nature itself is no longer natural in the sense that it can be simply taken for granted as a source of order and a source of instructions. And instead, like political life and like economic life, it's the result of a series of human decisions and actions that we may be more or less self-aware about. We may make those decisions quite clearly and intentionally, or we may make them sort of inadvertently and accidentally in the way that we continue to bring about, for instance, global climate change and other dimensions of the current ecological crisis. So that's the next thing that I want to talk about a little bit. Um, it seems to me that the coming of the Anthropocene is involved in a three-part crisis. A crisis of politics, a crisis of economics, and a crisis of ecology. The crisis of ecology is easiest to describe, so I'll take it first. It's the crisis of global climate change. It's the crisis of the sixth great extinction. It's the crisis of soil fertility. It's the, um, I could, I, I could go on, but it, it's, it is the overloading of natural systems on which life as we know it depends and which in a real way constitute life are the, as we know it, that are the kind of circulatory systems of life as we know it. The political crisis is not just the last election or the election before that, depending on your point of view. It's the deeper sense that the political institutions that we live under may be systemically incapable of grappling with the scale and weight of the questions that we're confronting. And here climate change is exemplary. There's a whole cottage industry <clears throat> of academics and commentators who will explain to you why as a matter of the rationality of individuals and the rationality of groups, we're not going to do anything about global climate change because each individual would rather let someone else do it. Each country would rather let someone else 
do it than take the burden on itself and doesn't trust others to do it anyway. And each generation finds it more convenient to sort of blithely use up its share of inherit, not I shouldn't say share, the portion of global, inherited global resources that it finds in front of itself and leave the trouble to whoever is coming along next. So climate change creates a series of global and intergenerational collective action problems which we can watch ourselves fail to rise to meet, explain to one another why we're failing to meet them and continue to fail to meet them, at least given the institutions we now have with which to make the kinds of binding collective decisions that you need to do anything about it. So this is a very serious crisis of politics. We can look at the problem, we can understand the problem and the sort of thing that would be necessary to rise to it and we can watch ourselves not doing it. We can say why we're not doing it and we can keep not doing it. There's a second dimension of the crisis <clears throat> of politics which is the pervasive suspicion right now that political life besides being a place where we make these um, ra these ra narrowly rational yet broadly catastrophic decisions that produce the global collective action problem of climate change. The suspicion is, the suspicion more and more people feel is that politics is also a deeply irrational activity, that if we look at the lessons of the last campaign, we find that when people make political decisions, they act more on the basis of emotional response, more on the basis of some kind of tribal or subcultural loyalty, who makes them feel good, who makes them feel offended, who gives them an excuse to feel angry about something they didn't know they were allowed to feel angry about, rather than on the basis of something more substantial and adequate to the problems that we, that we face. So politics is in crisis, ecology is in crisis, and conventional economic reasoning is in crisis in at least two ways. One um, is directly expressed in the global crisis of ecology. Um, Traditionally, environmental economics has concerned itself with what's called externalities, with the problems that are not included in the pricing system of transactions and so have to be accounted for by some regulatory or other add-on. But climate change and the other ecological crises that we're talking about um, are approaching a scale where it becomes kind of grotesque to refer to them as externalities with the implication that image gives that they are somehow outside of and secondary to our main concerns when in fact externalities seem to be shaping the whole globe in which all of our activity takes place and in ways that we're systemically failing to account for and respond to. Um, that is, the externalities seem in a sense to have taken over and nothing is external to the world that they are remaking and breaking down. Second point of economic crisis is the relatively new recognition since Thomas Piketty published a book in 2013 in translation called uh, Capital in the 21st Century that documented without being successfully contradicted so far that from most of the period of modern capitalism that we know anything about and can measure, economic inequality has steadily grown with the exception of a roughly 30 year period between about 1945 and 1975, which happens to be the period in which a lot of the common sense and sophisticated economic and other academic reasoning 
of our time was formed, but turns out to have been a totally anomalous moment. Turns out that most of the time, the kind of economic system we have, rather than raising all boats and bringing people to a kind of um, tolerable level of inequality and acceptable sharing of the benefits and burdens of economic life tends to produce enormous concentrations of wealth at the top and very substantial gaps between not only the resources but the life and social experience of the people at the economic top and everyone else. This was not the way we were told it worked and it may not be compatible with um, <clears throat> even the imperfect uh, forms of democracy and, and civic life that have been what we have to build on. So um, the three episodes of denaturalization correspond now to three kinds of crisis in ecology, in economics, and in politics. And the three crises in each of these denaturalized areas make the problem presented by denaturalization worse because not only do we have to make active choices about how to design and organize each of these areas of life, but we can't just let them bump along as they are because they are very visibly failing in the way in which they're bumping along now. So this is, this is our problem. Um, this, is, this is the moment we're in when um, the idea of the Anthropocene comes along to make us self-aware about the fact that it's a world that we're making. Um, so I'm not going to solve this problem. <laughs> but I, but I, I set it up. To, um, to give you a sense of how <laughs> intense it feels <laughs> to me um, when you think these things all through together. Um, now, about the Anthropocene, it's, a lot of people have suggested that it's a mistake to call it the age of humanity, the Anthropocene, because the world's remaking is not really being done by humanity as a unified and abstract kind of species. It's being done by, it's the consequence of, a particular way of organizing the world politically and economically. Taking climate change as our touchstone again, most of the greenhouse gases that are throwing atmospheric cyclical balance off are the products, of course, of the Industrial Revolution and thereafter. That is, they're the products of the modern, now globalized system of industrial capitalism with its patterns of exploitation and unequal growth, its vast difference between Europe and North America and the rest of the world. <clears throat> so people suggest we could get a stronger grip on the idea of the Anthropocene and be more exact about what we're talking about if we called it the Capitalocene instead, if we said that we're living in the age of capital when the world's ecological order is more and more taking on a shape that's given to it by our way of organizing our economic lives. So I don't really have a lot of investment <clears throat> in the question of which one we call it, but I am very enthusiastic about the set of questions that we're drawn to if we call it the capitalist scene. Um, that is, I think the Anthropocene idea directs us to ask the kinds of questions of political economy that people who want to use the term capitalist scene are pointing us to. Um, that those are the sorts of um, decisions that we need to, to take on. Um, and the way, the way that I am going to talk about them a bit today is, is, again, it's not going to solve the problems. I hope that it may 
give us some ground for a shared conversation in the second part of this so that we can make some progress toward, if not solving the problems, at least getting more of a common sense among ourselves of what might be involved in doing that. What I want to do is talk about how the idea of the Anthropocene learns from and contributes to one of the more intellectually exciting and promising things that's happening in universities right now, which is that historians, for the first time in decades, are turning in a really serious way to the history of capitalism and trying to understand it not just as our inevitable and natural condition, and to under, trying to understand it also not as what it was often implicitly treated as being in the 1990s and the early to mid-aughts, which was, in a phrase, the end of history. The thing after which nothing else, nothing else happens. Um, we're trying to think about it instead as something that came, not only came about, came into being in a certain way, which perhaps could have happened differently or didn't have to happen at all, um, but which might also give way to something better or worse, or just change profoundly without actually changing its name so that we better be very clear on what it is we're talking about so that we can watch it change or even try to participate in changing it. So I think this scholarly conversation about the history of capitalism, which opens up questions that I think are awfully important given the trajectories of denaturalization and threefold crisis that I talked about before, is a conversation that has a lot to offer to and a lot to take from the Anthropocene concept. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm going to start talking about now. Because believe it or not, all of this has been preliminary. <laughs> but I just wanted us to have this in common before we start in. Um, so one of the, the writers on nature and political economy that I most admire, Raymond Williams, famously observed <clears throat> that the idea of nature contains a great deal of human history if you don't know it, um, Williams' wonderful study of the material and ideological struggles around the English countryside called The City and the Country expresses as well as anyone has, I think, actually the country and the city, but that doesn't matter, um, that the landscape is itself a repository of a great deal of human history. And that history is now getting worked in more deeply than ever before. That's a hallmark of what I would call the Anthropocene's merger of historical time and geological time, because people are driving the history of the planet. The planet is evolving at the pace of social life, and so our landscapes are coming to bear our um, historical and economic imprint um, at a, in a deeper way and at a more rapid pace than ever before. <clears throat> so I talked before about the Anthropocene insight, that when we talk about nature, we're always speaking from certain cultural and political ideas of nature. And I want to suggest that in telling a history of how we make and remake and destroy landscapes, that ideas about nature are very important. That among the things that landscapes record are the images of the world and of the human place within it that people carry forms of social and political life, forms of economy, visions of justice, ways of assigning dignity or denying dignity. I think the Anthropocene idea, if we make it useful, contains not just the recognition of a vast human impact on the planet, but also the insight that ideas of nature have always also been ways of making claims about human beings and social life have always been themselves a politics, but a politics that has often denied its political character through the ultimate naturalization of claiming to be just speaking for nature. I think we can excavate those ideas in landscapes. We can trace them through the legal regimes that contribute to shaping those landscapes, and we can understand the legal regimes that shape landscapes as being circuits of a kind between ideas of nature on the one hand 
and the materiality of the landscapes on the other. So you could say politically effective ideas about the natural world and how people fit into it get worked into material form, get embodied partly through law, and so they're written on the land. So some examples. The farmland of the Midwest has that checkerboard pattern that everyone has seen from airplanes that is a transcription in the form of land deeds and cropping patterns of a picture of an agrarian republic spreading west. It's Thomas Jefferson's grid, quite literally. Each farm set up with enough <coughs> land, notionally, to support a family. Each one of those nestled into a larger pattern with checker squares that are reserved for schools and county seats. <coughs> but then there was a theory, a picture of nature behind that map. It was a theory that nature wanted Europeans to have it, but to have it on the condition that they filled it up with settlement and development. That was the theory and a whole web of 19th century law was the practice, a web of law that granted private property in return for settlement and development. You could get land for cash. You could get land by clearing forest, planting trees in grassland, draining wetlands, irrigating drylands, mining valuable minerals, sometimes even just by gathering stone. In other words, by transforming it in a way that made it marketable. That landscape with uh, its physical transcription of a legal order that was the expression of an ideological picture of how nature wanted to be used was part and parcel of an ideological celebration of the dignity of labor among citizens of a republic that is in some ways still something I think egalitarians should want to reach back to in American politics. It was also the theory that provided legal and ideological justification for the expropriation of Native American lands because it implied that the people already living there were failing to put the land to its proper use. And it was a theory whose official idea of the moral equivalence of each person's labor was shown totally false in the enslaved labor economies of the South. In North Carolina, where I live, for example, a settler could get an additional 50 acres on the frontier for each enslaved person that he brought onto the land on the theory that it increased his total potential productivity. So I'm trying to describe the translation through the ways that people live on and work land and claim it through ownership of an image of the world into uh, material shape. Uh, I started with the Midwestern checkerboard, but there are also more direct acts of translation. So parks and wilderness areas are memorials to a certain aesthetic, even a spiritual ideal of landscape and of the kind of person who can appreciate it. If you visit a national park or a wilderness area, especially one of the parks from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, like Yosemite or Glacier, you'll find a landscape that was picked out for its approximation to an aesthetic ideal. The principle of sublimity, wild and inspiring and inhuman nature, as theorized by lots of people, Immanuel Kant, Edmund Burke, and popularized for an American setting by Frederick Church and Asher Durand, other painters from the Hudson River School. These parks were created by acts of Congress to approximate a painterly ideal and make possible an embodied encounter with a nature that was supposed to present the same kind of inspiration um, as the paintings themselves had, had done a few decades before. <coughs> 
And of course, this landscape, which I would call a romantic landscape with a capital R, also, like the last one I talked about, has a deep history of inequality written into it. So Native Americans were cleared from the parks. John Muir, the great parks advocate, called them dirty and unpicturesque. Uh -huh. And the whole habit of seeing nature as being God's inspiring canvas appealed in the late 19th and early 20th century, as it does today to some extent, to a white upper middle class constituency, to people who, in groups like the early Sierra Club, which Muir founded in 1892, set themselves up as nature's special spokespersons. The people who knew how nature wanted to be seen and prized and what it was that it had to teach us. Um, and some of those people, like Madison Grant, who founded the first American groups devoted to saving the redwoods and the bison, were outright white supremacists. Grant wrote a book called Race, about race, that Hitler once called My Bible, a book that Teddy Roosevelt liked well enough to blurb it. So that romantic picture of nature also models a certain relationship between nature and capitalism, a division of the world into a standing reserve of resources on the one hand, and on the other, a network of vacation destinations. It's reprieves for the people that John Muir called nerve shaken and exhausted by city life. So creating the parks and the whole ideal that went along with them was a move in the attempt to define some goods and experiences as being outside the nexus of the industrial capitalist marketplace of the first Gilded Age. But of course, doing that presupposed both a level of economic and cultural privilege within that nexus and soon enough got reincorporated into it in the form of the high status vacation. Now we could also talk about the national forests and the lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management as legal expressions of a certain idea of what the natural world wants and how it needs to be managed. Um, the idea here, which was key to Teddy Roosevelt's view of, <clears throat> of what was required to make a strong modern state successful, was that nature was in fact intended to be useful to human beings, but that it was too complicated. Nature, natural systems were too complex to be managed and made productive by the laissez-faire system of personal ownership and market incentives that the private property system of the Jeffersonian grid set up. And instead, complex systems like watersheds and forests and soil regions needed, Roosevelt and his allies argued, to be managed on the scale of the phenomena themselves, like on a landscape scale or a watershed scale, and also at the scale of their complexity, which was to say they needed to be managed by experts, which was how we got the idea and then the reality of the National Forests and the Forest Service and the whole vast Western landscape that remains under direct federal administration by complex and still to some degree expert and ideally public spirited administrators. So again, there's an idea about nature, how it works, what it needs, that becomes a reality partly because it's expressed through a body of law that conforms an actual series of landscapes to its image and gives people who live in that image a landscape on which they can be the people for whom that world is the real world. So for these reformers, going back to the theme that talking about nature is often a way of talking about social life and a way of talking about other people, for them, what was true of the natural world was also true of the social world. So they talked about the conservation of forests and soil. They also talked about the conservation of 
um, what they called the great natural resource of human vitality and human health, which for them required managing big and complex social systems in this, on the same scale and with the same governance of expertise that forests and watersheds required. So they designed systems of antitrust law to control the concentration of corporate ownership, labor law to structure the relationship between workers and bosses, city planning, public health, even systems of education. They all described as exercises in human conservation. Roosevelt once said that his whole domestic program was really just the system of conservation applied in general to all of social life. And of course, in order to manage landscapes and social life at the scale that Roosevelt was describing, you needed a new kind of government. You needed a new kind of state, a new set of institutions. And so an idea of nature and the paradigm problems of, like I said, managing watersheds was at the very heart of the development of the 20th century state that we are living under. The one, by the way, that Steve Bannon says that he wants to break down. Um, just to connect it to events. Um, so here too, like before, the history has human hierarchy written right inside it. So Roosevelt's uh, chief conservation theorist and also the head of his forest service, Gifford Pinchot, was a leader in the eugenics movement, both in the US and internationally. For him, treating people and the natural world as a spectrum of resources to manage for general welfare, which looks sort of great when it was about securing public health in the sense of like helping people not to get cholera or making sure that they didn't get sick or killed on the job in the factory, um, starts to get more uncomfortable when you realize that for him it was also about managing the gene pool in the same kind of way that you managed forests. Um, so, at each of, we, we have a kind of three-part history of the making of American capitalism that is also about the making of American landscapes and it's also about a history of American ideas of nature. Um, a great deal of the private property that is still how the lion's share, about two-thirds of the country, is owned and managed, took place under the legal regime of property creation that I was describing. I took the Midwestern grid as its paradigm, but wherever it exists, outside of the original 13 colonies, it was mainly created under the regime of um, disposition of federal land into private hands that I was describing. We have in Roosevelt and Pinchot the kind of modern capital P progressive image that lies behind the New Deal vision of an intensely regulated capitalism that is closely tied to the activity and decision making of the political state and in which experts play a kind of key controlling and stabilizing and legitimating role as they did for Roosevelt and Pinchot with nature in a way that had not ever been true of the older laissez-faire picture. And then in between, we have the creation of um, an ideal that, of nature that involves trying to get outside the whole capitalist and political nexus of living with other people, having to deal with them, contend with them, negotiate with them, having to find ways to get by. The ideal of getting out to some place that's pure and free and inspiring. It's truly radically apart from it all. Nature is a kind of spiritual and aesthetic escape valve from the everyday. It's the idea that when they were creating the National Wilderness System, Senator Frank Church from Idaho uh, 
was expressing when he said that without wilderness, the United States would become a cage. That was the idea of nature that he was trying to preserve. But of course, it turns out that in its suppleness, um, capitalism is a system that finds ways to incorporate and put a price even on those things that are intended precisely to be escape routes or alternatives from it. And so, as I was saying, we've found ways, of course, to commodify the high status and restorative and inspiring vacation as a part of the, um, of the larger political economy. <clears throat> so that's the story I'd want to tell. If you talk about American capitalism, American landscapes, and American ideas of nature, all as part of a single narrative. I think that narrative is richer than if you were to try to tell it with only one or two of the three. Um, and at, at the very least, looking back over the ways that all of the landscapes we live in um, and many of the ideas that we still navigate by were created in this nexus of politics, economics, and ideas about nature suggests that the Anthropocene problem of figuring out what we're going to make of this world, what form we're going to give it, is not so radically new as it might have seemed, uh, as it seems to some people, and as it might have seemed in the way that I described it at the beginning of the lecture. In some ways, it's only a matter of being fully self-aware about something that we've actually been doing for a long time, but that we've often been doing in a way that's a little bit opaque to us as we're doing it. So those are my thoughts, and I think we should now just start talking about any part of them that any of you want to jump into. Me. And if you don't mind giving your name. Yeah. My name is Pat O'Connor. Pat, hi. Um, thanks a lot. It was a very thanks. stimulating talk. Very good to spend the Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure I understand why capitalism and why not, like Marshall Berman might have said, modernity? Why not globalization? Why not state development? Um, after all, the trajectory that you tracked for American state development, which you assigned to capitalistic development, um, occurred in every major government in the world at almost the same time, some of which were capitalistic, some of which weren't. So why capitalism, I guess? <coughs> So what would, what would you get out of if you started with modernity, say? I'm not sure. Um, perhaps a way to bring in non-capitalist governments like the Soviet Unions. Um, perhaps a way to sort of think in a more small c Catholic way about these processes. I'm not sure. And what if, what if you thought of it, what if, if state development were your starting point? Uh, but really, no, yeah, that tends to be my starting point. And so, so tell us about the advantages of starting that way. Um, I think it, it's a way of sort of thinking about sort of moving the subject away from individual human actors as the major decision makers and placing it instead in these kind of broader <laughs> historical contexts that are kind of pushing people's decision making as opposed to sort of assigning all of the agency to um, Gifford Pinchot, Teddy Roosevelt, etc. <clears throat> so that's so that's really thank you for sort of fleshing that out. Um, I would I would be delighted, you know, to have each of those conversations sort of concurrently. I guess the reason that I start it in this way is that <clears throat> I think the general logic of the Anthropocene is that economy creates ecology. And what I mean by that is that the ways that we move around, the ways that we stay you know, warm in the winter and cool in the summer, the ways that we get um, food from the earth, from the sun, um, those add up to a co like collective implicit landscape architecture and geochemical engineering. Um, project. 
And <clears throat> I'm inclined to say, in turn, that to the extent that politics is working, politics creates or at least modifies um, economic life, or at least I think it's the only mechanism we have to try to change the terms of economic life in a deliberate and binding way. Um, so it's, it's because I think in this sense, the people who say the world we're making is a specifically capitalist world, the, the capitalist scene argument, because I think that, that that's right in a basic way. And I want to I want to try in talking about this sort of thing to sort of extend that way of schematizing the problem backward to show what maybe previously neglected relationships it it brings out that I that I am, that I talk about it in this way. Um, but I'm, I'm generally very strongly small c Catholic in thinking that when we're talking about the whole ball of wax, you sort of need all hands on decks with all, with all, you know, with all different kinds of binoculars. I, I should say, though, because I, I think this is important. I, I, um, I, when I talk about people like Pinchot, Roosevelt, Jefferson, they're almost serving as placeholders for um, fields, fields of ideological presuppositions, ways of seeing the world. I don't mean to say that they made our world in any very direct individual fashion, but that they're sort of the exemplary expressions of, this, of the story that I'm trying to tell. That's, I think that doesn't so much, um, I think of that as not answering a challenge as much as sort of wel uh, welcoming uh, complementary angles on this. Is that, is that responsive? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Jill. 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 So, Perhaps one of the most pervasive ideological celebrations of the capital scene, capitalism scene, anthropocene. I think everyone appreciated the dominance of uh, market logic, right? So market logic now it's not just in economics, and it's in every modification of everything, including what I think a lot of folks would say is the most effective, efficient way we're going to solve the crisis that you spoke about, i.e. using market-based conservation tools. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear you speak a little bit about what you think are those possibilities and perhaps what I probably would see more as further problems and entrenchment of this logic that is part of the beginning of the problem, so it's hard to see how it's going to be the solution. <clears throat> yeah, right. So I think if you bring the story up to the present era, and you notice how in each of these previous moments, people have been thinking their particular program for organizing social and economic life is prefigured in, in and in some ways dictated by their conception of the natural world. But of course, in some way, what they're doing is always reading back into the natural world, the experience of an angle on social life that they're participating in. Um, and then you ask, well, how does that apply today? Well, I think the answer <laughs> is, is kind of overwhelming. When you look at the dominant conversations in policy schools, schools of environmental management, even places like the Nature Conservancy, you ask, how do you think about environmental problems around here? And people will say, well, we think about them as a series of market failures or a series of missing markets. The whole problem is that we have all these unpriced goods, and as long as they're not priced we don't properly, we don't value them. So the ideal is to generate essentially a kind of national and eventually global accounting that will give everything a price and get everything right on the bottom line. So the image really is of, of ecology as a kind of 
vast in co-ate market. Um, and the things that people notice about ecological relations turn out to be the same things that neoclassical economic theorists notice about economic life. An enormous amount of dispersed information, no one vantage point lets you see all of the relationships, can only be organized in mutually productive ways by setting the right organizing principles in motion in a kind of diffuse way. So the ecology becomes a version of what Friedrich Hayek described markets as being. So I think there are lots of mod like mid-scale ways that market modeled policy making can have advantages over other forms of policy making that are more directly con command and control. That's sort of not that interesting at this point. But what isn't, what is very interesting, I think, is the set of problems that get left out of this way of talking. Um, I think above all, that if you come at it from, from a lawyerly perspective, as well as a political economy perspective, you understand that strictly speaking, and any rigorous economist will say this as well, strictly speaking, there's no such thing as a, as a natural market. There's always a set of legal decisions and political decisions preceding it, defining who has what property rights, what they can do with them, what kinds of relations they can enter into. This is even just at the very driest level. Um, so when people say, oh, we need to get the right price onto everything, that's what we need to do. What they mean is we need to export onto the natural world via the economic order a whole series of substantive decisions about what things are worth, what things are precious, <laughs> what the value of life is in a very real way. Um, and I actually think on some level we, we do need to do a version of that. I think that's the problem the Anthropocene forces us to confront. What is the value of life? But to do it in a way that gets presented as just extending the logic of economic rationality as we now know it out has two huge dangers that are not at all theoretical. One is that you simply replicate the existing unequal distribution of resources and essentially you put the value on things that the current like spending capacity of people who have money indicates that they um, would you know, be willing to pay to, uh, or, or the way in which like a swamp's, a wetland's capacity to process pollutants out of waterways would show up on the um, bottom line of, uh, of a chemical companies' internal accounting or whatever other kind of direct translation of our economic regime you can do onto the um, ecological relations you're trying to govern. Or second, you just sort of plop down a very particular cultural view of what's precious and why onto a field of natural phenomena um, without thinking about whose ideas those are and how they got to be hegemonic, which is basically what Park's creation did. In some ways, great from my point of view, but I'm living within that tradition. In other ways, obviously, a lot got left out. So to, to sort of sum that up really quickly, I think the biggest politics of nature that denies its own political character is today the program of making the management of the natural world economically rational. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Sir. Hi there, my name is Dan Spencer. I oh, hi. Nice to meet you. I really have, um, the last few weeks I've been reading through the work of Nature, you just gave an incredibly concise kind of overview on that here. But I was especially you, um, in your book, I think you have, here you talk about kind of three sort of dominant narratives that get, of, of views of nature that get translated into a legal economic brain with the kind of original providential, kind of saying the, the, the cultivating continent, and then the preservation romantic view, and then the conservation managerial. Um, you seem to allude to a fourth possibility that an emerging kind of ecological uh, perspective, ecological view of nature, but the challenge then, can that be translated into a legal economic um, a framework where that, those kind of insights would be over there? And I, it seems to me that part of what the Anthropocene is doing is exposing really the, the fatal flaws of those first three visions, 
do you see the ecological as a possibility for addressing some of the concerns of the Anthropocene and any ways of beginning to translate that into a legal economic framework that would address those? Or are we in some, because uh, I sometimes think we're kind of in a, in a, in a race to the end between the, the neoliberal and the ecological and the Anthropocene, just putting that really stark contrast. But, I wonder what your perspective is on that. Right, so the, so the story I gave you sort of ends in 1964 when the Wilderness Act is passed. It's sort of the last great event in the three-way tug of war among these uh, conceptions of the natural world that I was talking about. And that's roughly the period when a fourth great view comes into the field. Um, and the the ecological view of how the world fits together, that the world is made up of a series of mutually permeable and complex systems that don't respect jurisdictional boundaries and don't even really respect the boundaries among organisms or types of entities so that what comes out of a smokestack ends up in the soil, ends up in the water, ends up in something else's flesh, ends up in your flesh. The problem was one of really profound interdependence. Um, which, among other things, totally changes the kinds of legal approaches that you can use to manage the problem because all of the earlier versions had depended on some way of deploying boundaries, boundaries of ownership, boundaries of jurisdiction that it turns out the problems just don't respect. Um, and all of, all of the major environmental laws that get passed after 1970 are in some ways attempts to incorporate the, the ecological recognition. I see the whole field of environmental argument these days as, as being two things concurrently. One is it's a four-way fight among the constituencies of the first three pictures and various versions of the ecological picture. Um, so for example, when those, when the, the Bundys and their friends took over the Malheur uh, Wildlife Reservation uh, last January, roughly, um, what was going on was in some ways people standing as representatives of the first idea that nature really belongs to people who dig that saleable stuff out of it and run cattle on it and um, you know, make, it, make it productive running up against both the administrators and experts of the, what I call the Roosevelt Pinchot kind of picture and its institutions, and the um, wilderness and biodiversity kind of devotees who for them are elite colonists, colonizers in the West who don't really have any, any place here. Um, the other thing that's going on, I think, is a fight over the meaning of ecology. Uh, and it's, it's such an encompassing idea that it can serve many agendas and can be filled out by many different pictures of the world. So I think of the exchange Jill and I just had as an example of what ecology can mean for environmental reformers that I would call a very neoliberal conception of ecology, that essentially the world just wants to be a market. It just turns out that the kind of market it wants to be is more complicated than the early privatizers thought. Um, so I think if I, were to, if I were to describe this one, I would say it's one of sort of contest over what we're going to take the consequences of ecology to be. Yes. I'm George Seilstead. Retired, has been, um, <laughs> never was. <laughs> You're aspirational for me. <laughs> the, the, so we have all, I agree, economics, politics, and uh, ecology is kind of hit a dead end, except what if, let me try this. The problem underneath all of it is the assumption by humans that nothing has any value unless there's a use for humans. It's not a, and, and therefore, oh, once you say, oh, this doesn't, well, let's establish it has some use for humans. Let's put a price on it then. That's what we do with economics. Then we have to have politics that says, well, we have to make sure because all these rich people want to make some of this money out of it and they control what we do. It's the whole series you talked about 
but underneath it all is trying to say, there's a world out there, and there's humans, and it's put there for us, and if it doesn't have any use, there's, then our whole ideas collapse totally. But it, I don't know if the, you can build this into the three categories you talked about. Well, I think w one of the one of the things that differentiates the three categories is different ways of thinking about what counts as the world being valuable to us. So I think if you're, if you're in, as I often am, sort of deep in a romantic picture of the natural world, my life is better if wolves exist. And it's better if they're out there getting to hunt and so on. Um, and if I never see them, as it happens, I never have. So that's totally alien to the first conception. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's almost antithetical to it. So I guess I, I think there are two ways of describing a similar contrast, the same contrast that you point to. We could describe as an argument over whether the world has to be valuable to us in order to be valuable, or whether it's valuable in itself. Or you could describe it as an argument over whether um, our lives are better just because the world is rich and complex and strange and, and not there to serve us at all. And I think of a lot of cultural developments and environmental argument in politics as attempts to say something like the second. So I guess I feel a lot of attraction to the way that you put it. But I think that, that we can maybe get hold of that idea in, in different ways, depending what we're trying to accomplish with, with the description. Um, Albert, Professor Borgman. I'll stand for this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the spirit of complementarity, I would like to suggest that one thing we have to look at is um, how the developments and forces that you've talked about result in things that people live with and in, the consumer goods that are produced. And uh, you touch on, on this now and then uh, when you talk about the comforts of eating and air conditioning and commodification, the results of which are these consumer goods. And it seems to me that to understand the situation we're in, we have to understand what's attractive about this kind of world and uh, what, how it informs people's view of the world, what they're willing to listen to, what they're interested in. And if we don't do that, it's as though we're just investigating the utility room in the basement. <laughs> and what we find that doesn't really make sense, uh, it seems needlessly uh, aggressive but controlling. And we forget, you know, that there's the living room upstairs in the kitchen that people live in. And uh, so I think that needs to be added. And, and my sense is that if we trace the development of how this uh, style of life came to be, you might find that it's losing its force. Mm. And uh, uh, we're no longer waiting every fall for the new model of car, <laughs> or, you know, preciously for the new iPhone or whatever. And, and that uh, part of our crisis is that the amity force of that style of life may begin to be spent. Uh. Yeah. So, I think there's. <clears throat> I think I agree with uh, with all of that. Um, <clears throat> for me, talking about the, the the particular ideas I talk about are interesting because I think they can be shown to have contributed to one uh, version of what you might call the living room, which is the landscapes generated by law. So it's, it's because I think of the ideas not just as sort of populating 
the part of our minds that influences how we see when we look out on a mountain, but that it, um, the, but rather are involved in the very active production of the material terrain that we live on. That I think they're, it's for that reason that I think they're interesting. But that's a way of saying that I find the direction you're asking to move in toward an account of the kind of material surroundings that we make for ourselves and what it is that those things and those patterns of things do for us and mean to us. Very congenial. Um, I think there's a way that we haven't really come to terms with that the whole idea of the environment and the, uh, the social world that's implicitly contrasted with it that we're still living with in a lot of ways are deeply a product of the beginning point of the full-on modern consumer economy and culture of the post-World War II period. And there's, there's a way in which what Rachel Carson is describing in Silent Spring is the intrusion on a world of safe and clean residential towns and suburban spaces of industrial poisons. But that was the first time, it was the first time in human history that large numbers of people had been living in these residential spaces that were separated from the economies of production, producing things or producing food. And it was a sort of product of that segregation and then the spillover that Carson was, was talking about. So this is only an attempt to say that I think you're describing something that's very, that's important to the birth of modern environmental imagination that happened in the period when our things became our home in a way, or our home came to be our things. And I would, I would like very much to talk more about that. You know, if you have, you want to follow up now or? It's just one thing. I must confess that of all your writings, I've only read the article you, that I owe to my student Charles. Uh, in, in 2014, when you sort of look back on your common thing. Yeah. The, the piece from N plus one. Yeah. 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 And it, it seems to me that I was saddened by your disavowal of your book, although I only know it from your own account. And I think the chap if, if the force of consumerism is spent, then the challenge is to go back to common things, but in a way that they have a secure place within the inevitably technological world. The thing I would say to that um, is that I found one slightly formulaic lesson from looking at the history of politically successful new ways of seeing and encountering the living world. And that's that they've, they've been most powerful when they've managed to combine in a single vision something to fear on the one hand and something to love on the other hand. On the one hand, they've promised like a new way of looking at the world has said, here's something we're in danger of losing or a threat that we're facing and we need to be able to see things in this new way, say the ecological way that Carson popularized in order to understand the threat. But there's always been correspondingly an idea that if we learn to see in this new way, whether it's seeing ecological interdependence and seeing how in a way the world is your body and your body is the world, which is scary but also amazing, um, or it's learning to go into a certain kind of painterly landscape and feel the way medieval pilgrims felt when they got to the cathedral or the sacred place. Um, that there's something that's, that's enriching, that, that expands even qualitatively, the possibility of, of your life in learning to see in this new way. I think um, in very like initial and inchoate ways, and maybe not only in those ways, the argument about what a politics and cultural practice for an age of ecology speaks to is trying to find ways to think of ourselves as rich without counting it in things. 
Um, and we, that, that is a, a kind of desperate cultural need because we, ecologically speaking, can't afford to do it, to keep doing it with things. Um, my, my postscript to that is that I think an economy of inequality and insecurity is a very bad thing for that cultural development. Because when people always have a, either they're just very vulnerable and precarious, or they feel they have a long way to fall, and they're vulnerable to becoming very vulnerable and precarious, there's a real way in which they are individually correct to say, I never feel like I have enough. I never feel like I have enough to be safe, enough to stop worrying. And when that's the individual logic, then the collective logic is that we can't take the strain of saying we need to slow down and change our focus. And that's why when economic growth slows, governments fall. Um, so I think there's a link between in the, of the following form, that a, a, an economy in which people are safer and have less to fear is part of the precondition of a political and cultural argument where there's more room to talk about valuing different things and living in a different way. Um, uh, so, yeah, please. Um, I'm Nicole Torin Rogers, um, and I I like the the metaphor of translation because I think it's also especially out in terms of as you mentioned earlier, who gets left out of the histories, who doesn't get to speak, uh, what kind of speech is privileged. And earlier in the talk, you um, mentioned looking at sort of the motivation for this, these kinds of studies can be to see what might have been or how could this have played out differently. And so my question is, what um, are some of your thoughts about the possibilities of um, someone from a marginalized position engaging with this kind of study and, and taking either inspiration or saying, you know, here are the more promising alternatives as opposed to here are the alternatives that are going to maintain, dismantle certain systems and institutions while maintaining others that will continue oppression. Well, here, here's an example. It's a re I really appreciate that question. Um, an example that in some ways comes from precisely this, this political moment. Um, so the Appalachian coal fields were huge Trump country, strongest Trump country anywhere, just about, um, in terms of the electoral totals. And when you're down there, but down there relative to where I grew up in central West Virginia, um, people have this very strong sense that the environmentalists are the enemy, the federal regulators are the enemy, and ironically, for an area with a history of labor militancy, the coal companies are, are your allies because at least they hate the same people. Um, and when I, when I look back through the history of political formations in that region, the thing I find striking is that just in the very early 1970s, an insurgent uh, labor movement called the Miners for Democracy, which actually succeeded in electing a president of the UMWA um, in 72, I think, um, argued that the mine workers ought to put environmental and public health considerations, as well as workplace health considerations, front and center in their program. And that, in fact, they ought to enforce those principles through direct labor actions, so that if they were asked to work in unsafe conditions, they should strike. And if they were asked to mine in ways that would produce acid mine drainage or um, un unrestorable forms of, mountain, of, of strip mining, this was before true mountaintop removal strip mining even came along, they should strike and refuse to do it. It's a sort of amazing moment of potential convergence between labor in what ended up being a very marginalized and reactionary community in the country and, and, and environmental programs. And there's a, there's a series of reasons, I think, having to do with the way um, 
modern environmentalism of its po in the post-1970 form got created in terms of the laws that got passed, the institutions that ended up being the heart of the day-to-day -day life of environmental advocacy, and the law that eventually got passed as a partial result of that, Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act in 1977, that the moment I'm talking about ended up being a path not taken, and coal and the coal fields and environmentalism became deadly enemies. At that moment, you, you had a, there and elsewhere the possibility that there could have been some meaningful, like defining alliance between labor and green forces. And I think that would have made for a really different configuration of forces now. I think there are a lot of diff other places that one could go with your question, which is so good and point, I mean, it, it points at everything. But this is, I hope, maybe a sort of slightly counterintuitive example that does some of the same work. Thank you for that. Charles? Um, just a side note, I really like your paper on that. The answer you just showed about the, the separation of uh, labor and environment. What, do you, is that published anywhere? OK, never mind. Well, anyway, you can find it on YouTube. <laughs> OK, so I just wanted to plug that, because it's a good paper about Appalachian history. Anyway, um, my question is about anti-politics. So, which I don't know if you use the word today, but in your work you have, you know, we need to admit that our talk about nature is political, and that's the Anthropocene insight, and this is, and this is great. And then there's to not do that, to not be self-conscious about that, we inevitably end up practicing anti-politics. We force this idea of nature in a hidden way into our discourse. And I guess, in general, I guess first I would want to say, could we explain more about what anti-politics is? Um, and then, really, I want to say, if we move to the Anthropocene insight, if we move to practicing real pol politics about our content, about our ideas of nature, do we have to accept, um, are we forced to accept a certain constructivism or anti-realism or something about nature's value? Do we have to all agree, theoretically, that when we switch to our romantic modes and when we celebrate the spring coming and when we just love it, do we have to then add the footnote, but it's not really valuable? And, and as long as we have that footnote, then our democratic discourse can be fair and can be self-aware. Self but if we don't add that footnote, then we're practicing on politics. Is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> So that's, the, that's a very, um, of course, deep and penetrating challenge. Um, so if, if it, it, Could you sort of repeat and summarize the question? It's hard to hear. Yeah, uh, sorry. Oh, um, so say a little, so yes. Um, so the question is about the concept of, of anti-politics. Um, I talked at a couple of points about a politics that denies that it's a politics because it appeals to nature and says that it's just carrying forward the demands of nature. So Charles said, one, say a little more what you mean by that, and referred to a term I use in the book, anti-politics. Um, and then said, well, actually, I'll spell that out a little further, and then I'll then describe your challenge. So, so anti-politics, I would say, it, it, I use to mean a form of politics that actively tries to take the question it's addressing off the political table by saying that in some way, if we only see the issue clearly, we'll see that it's already decided. It's decided by, say, <clears throat> a nat to take an historical example, like a natural racial hierarchy in 19th century racial pseudoscience. Or to take the example Jill and I were discussing, the question how to regulate ecosystems, once we realize that it's just a question of quasi-economic expertise, well, it's already decided. We just have to do it the way the properly trained ecological economists tell us to do it. Um, so anti-politics is like the body of arguments that gets you to the point of being able to say that a question of, of value and collective decision it's really not a question for us at all. It's, it's, a, it's a paradoxical kind of politics, right? Um, so Charles's question, um, challenge really, is <clears throat> if I want to say that when we talk about the value of nature, we're always partly talking about these 
contestable cultural, aesthetic, ethical, political ideas. Does that mean that we're only being intellectually honest when we don't really allow ourselves completely to mean what we say? <laughs> that we should, we should, I should say, for example, this morning, I was so excited to be in Missoula, I went up to the upper shoulder of Mount Sentinel, and I had a bunch of feelings about it that are of no real value because they're just cultural constructions which I've learned to participate in through a series of texts that I can cite to you. And then we're having an honest conversation about it, but not if I tell you, not, not if I say came out here and I lived here for 10 years and then someone wanted to tear down Mount Sentinel and I was just like, no, I'm gonna sit up there and not leave because it's precious and it's worth fighting for. And would that be like intellectually dishonest and democratically irresponsible because I'm pretending it's a real value? That's what you're challenging me with. Yeah, yeah. so, so, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 sort of. I think that, am, am I painting you into an unfair corner? I don't no, mean no, to. No, 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 that's, uh, that's the clarification I'm looking for, yeah. So I, guess. <clears throat> so, I mean, the, I guess the short is, I think a lot of our <clears throat> conversations about what's real and, and what's constructed in the area of value get driven into false binaries by uh, an artificial idea of what it would be for values to be real. <clears throat> I mean, without relying on divine revelation or something that's written down on a uh, tablet, well, I guess that's just divine, that's saying divine revelation a different way. <clears throat> I don't know how we could ever talk about what's valuable other than by saying we experience it as valuable, it matters, it matters to us. Um, there's a very, I think, useful distinction <clears throat> that the philosopher Bernard Williams makes in an essay on environmental politics and ideas where he says, in some ways the idea of value seems in the way that we use it to imply um, someone who experiences the value. It's, it's, a, it's a quality in a thing, rather like the thing being philosopher's parallel, being red, red or blue. It's, it's not clear what it would mean to say that the value would be there even if it couldn't be observed. But that doesn't mean that we have to think of the value either in selfish terms or in terms that are altogether arbitrary. I think of it as being sort of an arbitrary matter just of what we decide to stipulate. So I, I want to note that the, the rabbit hole that I've gone down in responding to your very helpful challenge is a very unsatisfactory rabbit hole. Not only because it's dark and smells like rabbits, <laughs> as I guess true of all rabbit holes, all good rabbit holes, um, but because I actually think this is a really, I find this a really deep dilemma. I find it almost a kind of, of antinomy in the sense that I think one is led to a pair of conflicting conclusions. One is on some level, values are what we decide they are. On the other hand, we only experience them as values because of a sense that we are perceiving, discerning something, encountering something. Um, and I, I, I've just come to think of that as an antinomy that we live in and not to allow myself to get too bothered by it. Um, and that's, that's, that's all I've got, except to say it seems to me like a very natural, a very natural antinomy, a very, if I can put it that way, given that we are just some consciousnesses in a world of many kinds of consciousness and many other fields of experience, right? And we're sort of caught in our own heads, but we're sort of always encountering things that are not us. And it seems to me that it, it couldn't but be a mystery because in some ways we're acknowledging the difference that we can never perfectly bridge between our perspective and the fact of a whole world that's independent of us and that we can't imagine not mattering to itself. Thank you.